Well, I want to welcome you all here today. My name is Jim Hopper. I'm the executive director of the Bainbridge Community Foundation. Um, today's presentation is sponsored uh, by, by three organizations, the Bainbridge Community Foundation um, Library U, which is an educational program of the Bainbridge Public Library, as well as the uh, Merriman Financial Education Foundation, which you will hear um, a little bit more about when Paul is speaking. Um, we at Bainbridge Community Foundation have a um, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and uh, ensuring that all, uh, all voices are, are heard and that we're um, respecting the, the backgrounds of other people. So I'm gonna to start today's uh, presentation with the um, Suquamish land acknowledgement. Uh, Paul and I and some others on the call are joining you from, um, from land that is the, in the, the original Aboriginal uh, land of the Suquamish people. Chief Seattle said, uh, who, was, who was a member of the, the Suquamish tribe, uh, Chief Seattle said, every part of the soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and grove has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in days long vanished. So we'd like to acknowledge that the land in which Paul and I and others are gathering on is Aboriginal territory of the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water. Expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquamish live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here the Suquamish live and protect the land and the waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. So um, just to, to get, before we get into our uh, presentation, I wanna tell you just a little bit about Bainbridge Community Foundation. So um, for those of you that are on Bainbridge, you might know about us, uh, but for those of you that are joining us from um, places afar, I'll tell you that you probably have a community foundation in your backyard. Uh, community foundations jobs are to understand the needs of the community to um, raise funds in order to support those needs and then to put grants out to nonprofit organizations that are actively doing work. And uh, here in our own community, when we think about the quality of life, whether it's the, um, the great school system or the access to nature or the, the arts and cultural community that we have, we've got nonprofit organizations and incredible donors who are, are standing up behind uh, all of those elements of the quality of life, helping to make them sustainable. So um, one of the commitments that we had, as I mentioned in diversity, equity, and inclusion is ensuring that people have access to educational tools that they often won't. And financial education is um, absolutely one of those areas in which, uh, in which that happens. We tend to leave our very best financial education uh, to those who have great financial resources, where those who have fewer financial resources are often left, left behind. So I'll, I'll introduce Paul in a moment. Paul is, the, is on a one-man crusade, hopefully not just one man, but uh, a personal crusade to ensure that um, there is greater equity in financial education. And this uh, presentation today is one of those things. But before I introduce Paul, I do wanna go through a few, lo few logistics. Um, we have, uh, we're, we're asking that you put your um, questions in the chat and um, I, will, I will help to make sure that those questions uh, get answered. We're all, we are gonna have a Q&A session um, toward the end of the presentation. So you're also welcome to save your question there. Um, if you have, uh, if you submit a question and you, 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 um, you have, uh, that, that's, that you wanna follow up to uh, Paul, for Paul to mention, um, go ahead and raise your hand and put the question in the, in the chat. That way it gives me the heads up that I, I'll stop Paul's uh, presentation to, to ask him that question. Um, we are, I think, ready to go, right, Paul? I'm ready. Okay, fantastic. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce Paul Merriman. Um, so Paul, in addition to being an incredible communitarian here on Bainbridge Island uh, and a, a member of our board, is a nationally recognized authority on mutual funds, index, 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 index investing, asset allocation, and both buy and hold and active management strategies. Now retired from his company Merriman, the Seattle-based investment advisory firm he founded in 1983, He's, dedicating, he's dedicated to educating investors, young and old, through weekly articles on Market Watch and via free ebooks, podcasts, articles, recommendations for mutual funds, ETFs, 401k plans, and more at his website. 
Um, and I'm sure many of you uh, are well aware of that since that's why you're joining us here today. In 2013, Paul created the Merriman Financial Education Foundation dedicated to providing comprehensive financial education to investors with information and tools to make decisions in their own best interest and successfully implement their retirement savings plan. In his retirement, Paul remains fervently committed to educating and empowering investors. In 2012, he wrote, wrote and published the How to Invest series, distilling his decades of experience into concise investment books targeted to specific audiences. Some of you are familiar with First Time Investor, Grow and Protect Your Money, Get Smarter, Get Screwed, Five Steps uh, to More Money, Less Risk, and More Peace of Mind, and of course, his latest book, We're Talking Millions. He's been called one of the best minds on Wall Street, and has been credited alongside Warren Buffett, Charles Schwab, Peter Lynch, just to name a few. And as I mentioned, he's a member of the, of the Community Foundation and is dedicated to improving the lives of those people around him. So with that, welcome, Paul. Thank, thank you, Jim, very much. Thanks for uh, I wanna make sure now that I have control here. Let me just confirm that. No, I guess I need to, I think you need to let me share Sorry, you can you can just redo the share there, Paul. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And Paul, as we're as we're getting started here, um, we have one question: How does emerging markets compare to small cap value in terms of risk adjusted return and historical evidence? So you, I'm pretty sure you'll be covering that. No. No. Great. No. Okay, well, I can tell you. <laughs> we're gonna get you started. That the emerging markets is more risky then you would find the small cap value or the small cap blend, higher, much higher volatility. But I may talk about that on the 15th in more detail. Sorry. Uh, what I am going to talk about today is, uh, first of all, this whole series we're doing here, and my thanks to Library U and to the, the Community Foundation to support this idea of focusing on our island and they were kind enough to let us expand it beyond the island and let everybody in on these presentations. We've got some great speakers coming up in the coming weeks. I'll talk about them later. But today I wanna talk about the, just one sec here. I'm, I wanna talk about a whole bunch of topics that are, seem to be on people's minds. One of those is about the bubble that's coming or that we're in. Another is about inflation that's about us. Another is about hedge funds and GameStop and, and uh, all sorts of things that are uh, the exciting aspect of the investment community, which may be more harmful than helpful to a lot of you, but we're gonna talk about a whole range of things that have to do with being a better investor. And it, this whole idea of being financially literate I think it's important to understand why I want to spend all this effort and, and all the teachers across the country who are now starting to teach financial literacy classes. The bottom line is we know that almost every major decision we make in our life has some financial aspect to it. And that, and that includes from the day that we're born until we die. Now, we have the good fortune, hopefully, of having people making good financial decisions when we're uh, in our childhood, but those decisions are still to be made. And it may be that this one topic, if we could educate students in, in all students in this whole topic of financial literacy could be a huge step from what we would think of as striving to thriving and at two uh, some level of success, whatever that might be that one is after. Uh, and then we are now being asked to solve a lot of financial problems we didn't have to solve before. When, when I was a 20-year-old, lots of people had pensions. When I was a 20-year-old, um, we, we, we didn't have IRAs or 401ks. We weren't asked to save. Other people saved for us. Well, that's changed. And today we are asked to take care of those things, which means people need to learn how in fact to do that.
How big is the payoff? Well, the, I, the payoff I think is 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 huge. Uh, on the fifteenth of April, I'll talk about twelve million dollar financial decisions. That's a pretty big impact, and those are twelve separate, each one a million dollar decision that every young person is going to make, either by design or by default. And if we can get people financially literate, they're going to make decisions in their best interest, not Wall Street's but their best interest. They're gonna have less debt and they're gonna pay less for it. We already know this is the case. They are going to invest earlier. They're going to have more equities in the portfolio. About 25% of millennials refuse to have any equities at all in their retirement portfolio. And some of that must come from not having the education to understand the implication of no equities in your portfolio. You have a chance to retire earlier, to have more money when you do retire. I think you'll set a better example for your children. And one of the things I have found is that people who understand the investing process are not as likely to jump ship when the process gets very difficult, when you're in a severe bear market. And if you don't really understand all of this financial stuff, it's hard to build a plan. You have to understand a lot of that information in order to build a, a legitimate long-term plan. We have challenges for young people today, huge challenges. There are more sources of easy credit. There are way more products available to us. And the Googles of the world and the Facebooks of the world and the Amazons of the world, they are so efficient at marketing that they are able to get more money out of the pocket of the, of the young people than ever before. And some of that money needs to be put aside. And if we don't get kids to understand why that's important, uh, they, they are likely to have a serious problem later in life. I've been around this now for over 55 years. And here's what I've learned. I've learned that most investors don't have a very good understanding of the process. In fact, one of the books I'll recommend today, Your Money and Your Brain, talks about all the different ways that people simply have it wrong about who they are and what they're doing and what kind of returns they've gotten. And I think that's because they just don't understand. And that difference, in fact, let me just share one of those studies. They, they, they looked at a bunch of, I think they were architects and engineers, two groups of people, wanted to know what kind of return have you had over the past X period of time? Don't remember how long that was. Their guesses, were four to 5% higher than what they actually experienced. And if those are the kind of returns you think you're getting, you could have made some really bad decisions about how much you need to save in order to get to the point where you'd be able to retire. So there's a, a lot of little things that people can learn. It's easy, none of it's difficult. But if you don't understand, that we have two major forces fighting, fighting, fighting for you to do the wrong thing. Now, when I say fighting, I don't, that's kind of radical, but Wall Street, you see, the more efficient you are as an investor, the more things you know that minimize expenses, that maximize diversification, that control the taxes, most of those things that you learn mean that Wall Street's not going to make as much money. They don't like that. I mean, they're, they have an obligation to make their corporations, their families grow. And the way they do it is in some ways to have investors invest rather inefficiently. But that is only the first, in fact, not even the worst enemy of investors. It turns out, according to the experts, that the worst enemy in all, of all is the person we look at in the mirror in the morning, ourselves, and the, our challenges around the emotions of money. Because the reality is when it comes to sex, food, and money, 
These are not intellectual decisions. They are emotional decisions that often drive the person, the investor in the wrong direction. And a lot of investors think that successful investing is all about taking risk. Actually, it is about understanding risk, but it should be all about managing risk. And I'll, I'll talk about those things later this morning. And I do believe that the best education is a good, I'm sorry, the best defense is a good education. Because if there are 25 risks that you face, and there are, I'm not gonna go through them all today, but there are, you should know how each one of those should be managed. Not so that you make less money, that really isn't the goal. No, we don't wanna manage the risk so you make less money, we want to manage the risk so you don't unnecessarily lose money that should have been in your pocket. And I think one of the challenges is that investors are so often focused on what's happening now. The short term is important to them. It turns out successful investing is actually about the long term, but we, we think about it all the, in, in terms of short term things. So I just want to picture for one second here, there, this, this circle, this universe of all investment knowledge. And there's stuff going on inside that circle. I don't want you to worry about because you can't do anything about it. And then there's stuff going on in that circle that you can do something about. And I want to kind of for a second picture how much you might know about what's in that circle because if everything there is to know about investing, nobody can know everything. There is a piece though that represents what you know you know. You might know mutual funds are better than picking individual stocks for you. You might know that low expenses are better than high expenses for you. You might know that putting away money inside of a tax deferred or tax free investment is better for you than paying taxes for the next 30 years. 40 years on that money. There's a whole bunch of things that you could say, I know, but then there's what you know, you don't know. And it seems like a lot of those questions people ask me are about the things they know they don't know, and they think that somebody in the industry knows. Well, the good news is, if you want to think of it as good news, that nobody knows the future, what returns will be in the coming years. When we think we know, we can be so unbelievably off base that it's, uh, that it's, it, it's just, you can't, you can't believe it. For example, in, at, in the late 90s, surveys were taken of investors about what they expected over the next decade, the S&P 500 would return. And those numbers range between 20 and 30% a year. Now, I think many of you know the S&P 500 has a long history over 90 years, although most of it's hypothetical, but they show it as the history of the S&P 500 of compounding at 10%. How could anybody believe that for a decade, there would be a compound rate of return of 20 to 30%? Well, it's easy because the most recent thing that had happened to investors in 1999 is from 95 to 99, the S&P 500 had compounded at over 28% a year. So now they wanna know, are we gonna have more of that? Well, we know it's unlikely, but we don't know what it's going to be. And we have to deal with that. It's because there's so much that I know I don't know that diversification, that word means so much to me and hopefully to you too. And then there's a piece of pie that represents what you don't know you don't know. And the fact that you don't even know that you don't know it would suggest you have no idea how big that piece of pie is. Could be large, could be small. But the sad fact is, so many of the times something happened to investors that, that caused them great grief was because they didn't even know this particular risk was around them. So maybe they had all their money in one company because 
that was the company they knew, that was the company they trusted. But then something they didn't know, they didn't know, sunk their, their in, in investor ship. And so that piece of pie is important. Another reason why I am a great believer in massive diversification. And there's what you, the, what you know, you know, but you're wrong. I love this piece of pie because it has been the basis of me building a collection of myths, investment myths, over 200 of them. There are so many things that people actually believe drive the investment process. It turns out those things are in fact, not what drives the process, but a lot of people make decisions based on those myths that can be really expensive. And then there's what you know, you know, but you don't do anything about it. I have spent my life on a diet since the fifth grade. And at some level, I could say, I'm an expert on losing weight. And yet, what have I done about it? Well, the evidence is not very good. But the fact is, I know this stuff, but sometimes putting it into action for some reason, oftentimes because there are emotions, remember, sex, food, and money, there's that food, that's some type of thing that emotions get in the way of the intellect. But what I spend my time on in trying to help people is these two pieces of this pie. I want to expand what you know you know. Warren Buffett said, to be a success, you only have to do a very few things right, as long as you don't do too many things wrong. I wanna make sure you know those very few things you need to do right. Because if you can get those right and then not do the wrong things, unfortunately, too many people want you to do the wrong things. But if I can get you to see that, and by the way, it's not unusual that people in this business see things from two different sides. So. Uh, I, I'm not the, the last expert on earth, but I do know this, that it's not just enough to get you to know these things, but somehow through the work that we do, and I'm not an investment advisor, I'm just a teacher, and with the help of Rich Buck, I'm a writer, and with the help of Tom Cock, learned to be a podcaster years ago, but I want to know. How do I get you to actually do the things? What could I say to motivate you to change in your best interest? I don't get a penny from people for doing what I do. So this is not about me getting rich off of you. It's about me helping you take care of yourself. Here are the kind of questions I get from investors that make me believe that their concerns are short term. The market's very high. What should we be doing now? Tesla is down from its high. Should we be buying on dips? Inflation is heating up. What, what do we do? How do we make money when we have higher inflation? And if interest rates are rising, why would anybody put money in bonds? I mean, that's crazy. And the Bitcoin, obviously this is an easy way to make money. Is it a good investment for the long term? Now, that's the one that in a sense comes the closest to being what we want to know. Is something that we're putting money into good for the long term? Warren Buffett said his, his favorite investment period was forever. Now, the rest of the story is Warren Buffett has sold many of the companies he's purchased. So it's forever until he decides it's not forever. But the bottom line is good investing is about the long term. Short term moves are really more about speculation. But let's talk about the cryptocurrencies for a second. I have unfortunately, when I say unfortunately, uh, it's unfortunate for the people who asked me because it sounded like they were about to put their money into Bitcoin. And I would go into my song and dance about why I don't think Bitcoin is a good place to invest. But it turns out that's like trying to convince somebody who thinks they have the winning lottery ticket and the winning lottery ticket is the numbers that they have. 
say, no, 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 it doesn't make any sense to put money into lotteries. Yeah, try to tell that to a winner of a lottery. Well, the fact is, the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies, basically this is a currency for people to buy and sell services. And that's cash, basically. It's a, what we consider to be like cash, but it's digital cash. And typically, we don't think of investing in cash or currencies. Yes, currencies rise and fall. And some very rich, smart people have placed very large bets on the rise and the collapse of currencies. But the fact is, when you put money into a currency like Bitcoin, that there's this possibility they won't survive. It's hard to find a place you can go cash in a Confederate bond or Confederate cash. And there are over a thousand cryptocurrencies that have failed. And they are unregulated. They are, you are exposed to fraud and theft and the complete loss of all of your money. And if you don't have that little key that tells you what Bitcoin is yours, it's gone forever. I mean, the people who have lost their key and lost, literally lost over a hundred million dollars. Oh. Not, there we go, sorry. So let's talk about speculating, investing and gambling. First of all, I saw some numbers that were really interesting about gambling that I, I was surprised that it's been studied, but well, I shouldn't be surprised, but it has been studied. And it turns out that some 4,400 people were, were surveyed, gamblers. And it turned out that, uh, the, and this was for over two years, and of the 4,222 gamblers, seven of them made over $5,000 over that period of time. 217 lost over $5,000. Uh, while gambling is something that people like to do because you don't have to wait around for the S&P 500 for 10 or 20 years to get your return, you get your return now. And you learn whether black or red, whether you get to double your money or not now. That's the way gambling works. Speculating is different. And there is little evidence that speculating, well, by the way, there's lots of evidence that speculating leads to huge returns for some people. But our work and the work of, I think anybody who's trying to get people to do the right thing for the long term is really based on high probability success, very high probability success. Day trading, 3% of day traders make money. I'm thinking that's not a very good probability. I can't, how could I possibly recommend to a young person that the key to success is be a really good day trader? Now there are people who make a ton of money on day trading. They are generally the people who sell the, the classes, the, the educational material to people so they can lose money trying to day trade. Hedge funds have been in the news a lot lately. Hedge funds have a terrible track record. At, at the end of 10 years, only about 5% of the hedge funds that, that started 10 years earlier are still in business. Those are not great probabilities. Of course, the few that do magnificently well, that's something different, okay? They get all the press. They're the ones that cause people to drool over the idea of being rich and being able to put money in hedge funds. On the other hand, the S&P 500, if we look at the results over all the 15 year periods going back to uh, 1926, I think it is, or 28. Anyway, all of them profitable. 
And if you go out 40 years, not only are all of them profitable, but the average 40 year return on the S&P 500 is an 11% compound rate of return, the best 12.5, the worst 8.9. So what that says to me, if I want to invest in something that is likely to give me a really good return, and by the way, you may not see 10% as a really good return. I will write articles about making 10% and I will almost every time be questioned, where do you think you can make 10%, Mr. Merriman? They haven't found it, but in fact, that has been the, the compound rate of return as it has been the compound rate of return for the total market index since they've tracked it, they've rebuilt it going back to the 1920s, just like they've rebuilt the S&P 500, virtually the same return. And here's what I find fascinating, just fascinating. Dr. Bessenbinder, in fact, you can read the report. The report is entitled, Do Stocks Outperform T-Bills? But Historically, going back to 1926, whoops, going back to 1926, one out of 25 companies, public companies, have hit home runs. We're talking life-changing kinds of compound rates of return. I'll show you a couple of those in just a few minutes. And I'm sure everybody knows who the ones are that have popped up recently. Sometimes they don't know the ones that happened 50 years ago, but but I'm gonna show you a few in a second. On the other hand, the other 24 out of 25 stocks as a group averaged 3%. Now I'm going back to probabilities. Here's what the academics tell us. The academics tell us if you'd be happy with the 10%, you're better off just to buy them all and you're guaranteed to get that one out of 25. I own Tesla, I own Microsoft, I, I own Facebook. In fact, I own, I, not just my money, my wife's and our investments, we own TradeStop. We bought TradeStop at under $10 a share. And I, I, I called the mutual fund, by the way, that did it to find out if they sold. And yes, they did. They sold at over $300 a share. I did all of that by simply putting the money into a portfolio that basically, because there's more than one fund in that portfolio, kind of owns everything. The right balance of the different asset classes for me. But I have chosen, and I think investors are smarter, to choose the total rather than trying to look for the one in 25. There's an article, if you, if you simply do a search for top 50 companies of all time, it's a Kiplinger piece. Uh, and there's a reason I'm a great fan of, of Kiplinger. I've got them on a list later that I'll, uh, that I'll give you. And that's because they have, if you are taking their online newsletter, so many wonderful lists. I happen to love lists. And, uh, and so I find it a great source of information, whether it's about taxes or mutual funds, interesting stuff. Of course, they want interesting stuff because they need those eyeballs on those sites to sell advertising. But they looked at the Besson Binder study and they looked at the top 50 companies. This is not all 50. I didn't even pick the, the biggest 50, but these are out of that 50. But I wanted you to see something interesting. It shows when they started, and then McDonald's started in 66. And from 66 to 2016, they compounded at 17.9%. That's a fantastic return. And, and over the last 15 years, and the reason I use 15 is I can go right into Morningstar and see what something did, whether it's a mutual fund or a stock for the last 15 years, but McDonald's has compounded at 
That's, that's really good. Pfizer started in 44, and by 2016, it had compounded at 15% over the last 15 years, 5.2. Let me drop down to Coca-Cola. From 1926 to 2016, 13.1, but the last 15 years, 8.4. And it is so interesting to look at GE because GE, when because I've been around this business for 50 years, for most of that 50 years, you'd be an idiot not to own GE. And yet over the last 15 years, a negative 2.5% a year. What is interesting is the S&P 500 compounded at 10 for the 50 years and compounded for uh, almost uh, 10 uh, for, the, for the last uh, uh, 15 years. It is historically so dependable. Remember I talked a little while ago about from 1995 to 99 compounded at 28.5%, the S&P 500. And prior to that, it had always compounded at about 10 over long periods of time. If you include the, if you start at the beginning of 1995 and you go through 2020, guess what the compound rate of return of the S&P is? It's about 10%. And so uh, this is a choice that we make. Do we try to pick those companies that are gonna outshine the rest, and a lot of them don't. Exxon, Exxon is the number one provider of earnings in history of public companies. And yet its return from 1926 to 2016 is only 11.9%. Yes, better than the S&P 500, but over the last 15 years, 2.8%. I want to talk about the magic of compounding. And in a second, you're going to have to be patient with me because I don't do humor. Or if I do humor, I don't do it well. But I'm going to try to be humorous for one moment. I just want to prepare you that it's not on this slide. But this slide is the setup for the next slide. And that is we don't do well with this concept of compounding. We, we just don't get how powerful it is. I personally would love to leave $2.7 million to the Bainbridge Community Foundation. And it's really easy. They'll have to wait a while to get it. But if I could find a newborn child, open up an account in that newborn child's name for $100, and then as the child gets to 15, 16 years old, whatever the $100 has grown to, let's get it over into a Roth IRA. And then let's just let it go. And let's, let's just let it go until that child turns 90. And then let's give it away to BCF. Because at a 12% compound rate of return, yes, I've been talking about 10 with the S&P 500. I understand that. But it turns out small cap value has compounded at over 13. Why? Because it's more risky. I'll talk about that on the 15th. But here's the bottom line. At a 12% compound rate of return, $100 turns into 2.7 million over a 90 year period. So it's not difficult to do, but it is kind of remarkable of that building money on top of money on top of money. But then there's a problem we run into. There is the magic of compounding in reverse. It is called inflation. Because that $2.7 million, when you inflation adjust it over that 90 year period, is only worth 173,000. 
That's the impact of inflation. And this is a reality that we have to face when we're building the plan. Now, I want you to have a plan. I want you to, to, to put inflation in there as part of that plan. Because if you don't put inflation in there, you may think you only need a million dollars when in fact you need $5 million if you wanna replace the $60,000 a year now that you think you could, group, you could retire on in 40 years. Inflation adjusted. It, 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 it could be $200,000. So is 3% inflation, is 3% inflation the right number? Well, remember Johnny Carson, Ed McMahon? Remember Karnak with his envelope? Well, as I was thinking about this is 3% the right number, I thought about a possible Karnak the Magnificent bit. He gets the envelope. The, uh, the question is, or I'm sorry, the answer is, the answer is one, I'm sorry, over two septillion dollars. And then he opens it up and he would always blow in it and then he'd take it out. Of course, they would always interchange some, say something smart alecky. And the question is, what will a five cent piece of bubble gum cost in 2000 years with 3% annual inflation? Over two septillion dollars. As a matter of fact, one thing I didn't mention about the last, the last slide, I forgot this part of the setup. The visible universe that we see, not we see, but the scientists can see, is one septillion miles across. There's 140 billion galaxies within this universe, according to the scientists. But there's one septillion. We're talking about this piece of gum that today costs five cents, let's say, costing two septillion dollars in 2000 years if we accept 3% as the inflation rate. It really makes me curious to know what, what will our currency be like in 2000 years? But the thing about inflation is people spend a lot of time, a lot of time worried about losing money in a market decline. A lot of time worrying about bear markets and how devastating they could be. And yes, bear markets, happen about every four or five years. And yes, on average, they lose about 30%. During the decade of 2000 through 2009, there were two bear markets that cost investors 50%, okay? Bear markets are not our problem historically. Now, if you're a retiree and you just retired and you have all your money in the market and it goes down 50%, you got a problem, which is why you wouldn't have all of your money in the market more than likely. But the real bear market is inflation because it will take away 70 to 80% likely over your lifetime working up to retirement and then beyond retirement. It has a huge impact, which is why we so want young people to focus on equities. Go for the gas, not for the break. The bonds are the break. Go for the gas when you're young and have the opportunity to take advantage of bear markets. That's the way real investing should be done. But inflation may be upon us, and what are we to do now? We know that historically stocks make about 10% and there's 3% inflation. So the net for stocks is approximately 7%. And the inflation is around 3%. So we know that's a plus for stocks. Yes, they're volatile, but they don't 
They, they bonds just don't come as close to doing the job as stocks do. Plus stocks have a long history of earnings and growth and dividends of about 5% of year. Earnings and dividends, both growing historically. But a lot of people are concerned about bonds and the fact that if bonds interest rates go up, bonds can go down. Long-term bonds go down more than short-term bonds. I'm gonna show you some good numbers here in just a second. But people oftentimes will say, why would you ever wanna put your money in something that when interest rates go up, they're gonna go down? And those same people, I'm always kind of shocked at this, are sitting on a portfolio of stocks that have built into them a 50% loss. Both Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch have said, if you're not willing to lose half of your money, you shouldn't be in the stock market. So let's talk about bonds, how different kinds of bonds act during inflation. Let's talk about the worst inflationary period from 1968 to 1981. Inflation was 7.6%. And the S&P 500 over that same 14 year period, it made 6% a year. That's before inflation. It's large cap blend, by the way. Small cap, the S&P 500 is basically a large cap blend, some growth, some value. There's also large cap value. Those are the out of favor companies that are large. And you'll see that during that same period, they made 10.7%, even better. And small cap blend, smaller companies, growth and value compounded at 9.5. And small cap value, the, the gold ring asset class historically for return, 13.6. But if you wanna be prudent, you build a portfolio that holds all four, the four fund combo that we write about at length, 10% compound rate of return over that same period. Historically, a better protection against inflation. But let's look at the bonds. T-bills actually compounded at 7.2% a year. T-bills, 30-day T-bills almost what you would consider to be absolutely no risk made almost as much as that inflation, which is the tendency for the short-term instruments like money market funds to do. Five-year treasuries, a little more maturity, 6.2, and long-term government bonds, 3.3. And oftentimes when we look at long periods of time, we look at the bottom line, we miss some of the, of the reality of living through how you got there. Let me show you the reality for that period of time. There it is. There's year by year, long-term government bonds. Looks to me like there's six losing years there. I'm sorry, seven losing years with long-term government bonds. The five-year treasuries can't stay as close to what's happening now. So there was one year loss here, but the one month T-bills never had a, a losing year. So you could conclude if you want to, the smart thing to do if you wanna be a market timer and you wanna move to where the best action is, is in short-term bonds, maybe five-year treasuries, intermediates. Certainly the long-term government bonds are at much higher risk. But I wanna point out something here, even with the terrible performance of the long-term government bonds, those losses are chicken feed compared to what happened to the S&P 500 right around here, 73 and 74. I mean, you can complain about putting money in something that went down, I'm talking the bonds, but the losses, remember, gas, that's the growth, the break, 
That, that's the bonds. It acted like a brick. Even in the worst of times, even the long-term government bonds did act as a break compared to the losses of the stock market. So it's, uh, is this a lesson worth considering? Well, you know, the problem is every time we have a long period of some sort of thing happening, whether it's high growth, low growth, no growth, one period, you might do a certain, certain things to um, in, develop a portfolio and it performs a certain way. And then the next time a similar thing happens, you, you try to build the same portfolio and it doesn't work. Give you an example. From, 19, from 2000 to 2002, the S&P 500 was just terrible. If you had your money in a broadly diversified portfolio, you actually, at the end of that three-year period, about broke even in an all-equity portfolio. It was an amazing difference. Then the next bear market happened in 2007 through 2009. Guess what? Both the S&P 500 and the broadly diversified portfolio failed and both lost around 40%. So just because we see this grand return back during this period when inflation was terrible, doesn't mean it will happen the same way. It's, the, it's just a strange thing about, about building portfolios to survive each situation. If you try to build a portfolio based on the bad thing that just happened to you, most often you'll find it doesn't work to protect you the way that you thought it would. For example, I've seen people who after a 2000 through 2002 thought the smart way to make money in the market is to hire people who short the market. So when the market goes down, they're making money on those investments while the market goes down. That's how shorting works. Well, it turns out the worst performance long-term you could ever, ever put into your portfolio would be a short seller. And so the, it is just one of the difficult things with investors. They love doing what just recently did well for investors. So again, massive diversification. I think that's still the right answer. Well, let's talk about bubbles because a lot of people, uh, professionals, smart economists, whatnot, think we are likely in a bubble. And uh, bubbles are, I think, are fascinating. Um, Alan Greenspan claims he did not see the collapse in the US housing market that happened uh, in 2009, 2008, and nine. Um, the dot com bubble that happened from 2000 through 2002. You talk to read stuff that people wrote after it was all over. And this, yeah, we knew it was coming. We, we just didn't know how to stop making the big money. We kept hanging in there for the, the next good deal. In 2000, 2002, uh, people lost in the dot-com bubble. If you didn't lose everything because you owned a couple of companies that went totally bust, if you owned a, a, a diversified portfolio, you probably lost 80%. Japanese market is fascinating as a, as a bubble because you had this huge run up from 1950 through uh, 1990, 40 years making, I think it was over 17% a year. And right at the end, it got really, really good. Kind of like what happened at the end with the S&P 500 in the late nineties. But then there was a collapse, a big time collapse. And today, the market is still, I think, uh, probably 25, 30% under where it peaked back in 1990, late 89. The stories about the value in Japanese real estate is just, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, it, if you don't know that story, young people, go to uh, Wikipedia or go to Investopedia and read the story about the history of the Japanese real estate and stock market 
bubbles. 29 to 33, you could have lost 90% of your money in US stocks pretty easily. In the S&P 500, it probably wouldn't have been 90, probably would have been more around 80. And in the small cap, it could have been 95. Huge declines. And the Dutch tulip bubble, in that 36 to 37 year, it went up 20 times, tulips did. The price of tulips went up 20 times. And within that same period of time, it collapsed to be down 99%. I just heard this morning that my, my grandson, oh, now I can't remember, it's getting old, it's terrible, but um, he builds little buildings and things, Legos, that's it, Legos. Legos are, are, are going at huge premiums, they're collectibles. Art, look what art is doing. Somebody gets what, $69 million for a picture of a whole bunch of faces. Um, who's to understand this kind of thing? Uh, it will be, in many cases, these things like beanie babies, babies will be laughed at. But there is a downside to this, and it's a horrible downside. And that's what happens to the individual investor so often. I'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes about Jason Zweig and his your money and your brain. But one of the things that we know is that people have a tendency to think that what has happened recently, I mentioned this earlier, has more meaning than what happened before. Even down to flipping a coin, there is no particular belief about a head or a tail on one flip. They can't make a decision what the next one will be because eh, that's a random event. But if you get two heads in a row, it turns out that way more people pick another head coming on the third flip. What's that? What's, where's that coming from? Where's the evidence that that should be the case? It's just the human mind at work thinking linearly with recency bias. And so when something is just going great, those people who decided that they could go flip a house in 2008, 2000, they wanted to make some quick money, borrow some money, easy pickings, and they get hurt and they get sick back for a lifetime. That's what I worry about is all those people who get suckered. And it's a sucker punch because one bad bubble can 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 take 10 years off of when you're going to retire or i should say add 10 years i remember speaking to an investment club back in late 99 early 2000 and i was told by one of the members of that club that they had been all their lives cd investors and utility utility company stock, really conservative. But they belonged to this club and everybody was getting rich, making big money in stocks. And by the way, I never know whether to believe those stories when people tell them, but it was enough for these people to cash out the CDs and the utility stocks and go all the way, all the way. Now, these people are hard workers and they earned it all back what they lost, but it put off their retirement for, I think at least five years before they could get where they wanted to be. And um, I worry about that, particularly since younger to people today, young people, I, I do believe that they've got more challenges in the future than certainly people of my generation you're having to compete with everybody in the world now. I didn't have to compete with everybody in the world, but they do now. And when you are a believer, when you are a believer, excuse me here, when you are a believer that this is, this is going to work, you don't have to have diversification. You can just pile on. As a matter of fact, you can even 
you're so convinced you can add leverage. And the fact is, at the peak of those markets, brokers, salespeople who live on commissions, I don't mean everybody's evil that sells something that's got a commission on them, but I can tell you what I was told when I went into that industry back in the 60s, I was in that industry for about three years, that the reality is during these big bull markets, you got to make your money because you make nothing during the bear markets. So you know what that means. These people, they understand the psychology of all of this. And they're sitting on a bunch of dogs and they seem they've, they've missed this big run. Well, there's still time. And the other thing that is not spoken of often is that when people suffer these large losses, never again, I'm never doing that again. Stock marketplace, that's just a, it, it's just, you might as well go to Las Vegas. Just a gamble. No, it's not just a gamble. But a lot of the things that people do with the stock market, I would say, yes, are a gamble. Are we in a bubble now? Could be, I don't know. Fear of, of, of missing out, the fear of missing out, which drives people to get in, it's very high. A lot of day trading going on. In fact, there's more day trading going on right now. More day trading than there is in, uh, in institutional trading. And the biggest fool concept, that theory that it's okay, you're a fool if you buy something, but as long as you can find a bigger fool to sell it to, it's okay. And there's always somebody calling for a bubble. There's always good news and bad news. There's always list A, the good news. There's always list B, the bad news. So it could be, what do you do? I say you carry on. If you have the right balance of big and small and value and growth and equity and fixed income and US and international, and I'm not talking you doing exactly what I recommend, I'm talking about you have found your own personal ultimate portfolio. You just keep doing your dollar cost averaging, or if you're living off that money in retirement and you have the right amount of fixed income in the portfolio, there you go, you're okay. You're always ready for the big decline. My wife and I, we're 50-50 stocks and bonds. We know we're gonna take a hit one of these days. In fact, we're shocked we've done as well as we have. Because over the last years, the, the news hasn't all been that good. But yes, you got to make sure it's built for your risk tolerance. I think it's never the right time to do the wrong thing. It's just that most of us need someone to help us clean house. But for young people, the bubbles and the bears lead to great buying opportunities. That's at least my experience. A free lunch? Yeah, there are lots of free lunches on Wall Street. If you shop CDs, you can get better returns and not take one ounce of additional risk. More diversification? What the industry says, the academic side of the industry says, diversification is a free lunch because the expected rate of return of one stock is the same as a thousand in the same asset class. So if you own a thousand, you are expected to get the same rate of return as one, but the run, the one could be Enron. Not having to pay loads is kind of a free lunch. After that's the commission to buy mutual funds after maybe you spend a lifetime buying load funds. There are now literally mutual funds that have no expenses, no expenses. We have commission tree freight, uh, commission free trading and target date funds. I'll tell you why I say that target date funds are a free lunch. Historically, when you buy a mutual fund, what they do for you is they put together a portfolio of the best stocks they know. And it's your job to figure out, okay, I got that fund, that Janus fund, which was very, very popular in the 90s. And over here, I've got some fixed income. And so I will know as an investor how to make that change to go from less of that 
of that Janus fund into more of that bond fund. And most people don't get that right, aren't very good at that. In fact, they really hate to sell that equity fund when it's doing so well. But inside of a target date fund, not only do they pick the individual stocks that need to be in that fund, but they change the bonds based on how far you are from retirement. They are a fantastic uh, a product. I get a lot of questions here on Bainbridge about ESG funds, what we used to call socially responsible funds. And now it's about sustainability and, and, and other things, but it's still the same thing, looking for companies that somehow are doing good uh, for the long term. I would have in the past said, no, I don't think you'll make as much money in the ESG funds as you would in a standard mutual fund, but expenses have come down in the ESG funds, turnover down, diversification better. So I gave you three examples here of very low expenses and returns that are virtually market or better rates of return. So yes, I do think that, you, but, but by the way, when I say I think you can have ESG funds, socially responsible funds that will do as well as the normally managed funds, but not if they have high expenses, high turnover and minimal diversification. The investor's worst met enemy themselves. I mentioned that earlier. There is Ben Graham, the father of security analysis, the investor's chief problem and even his worst enemy is likely to be himself. And uh, Gardner Morris in a uh, article in the Harvard Review, Business Review, says uh, not a second goes by that our ancient dog brains aren't conferring with our modern cortexes to influence their choices. And then one of my favorite book authors, Jason Zweig, the best investors make a habit of putting procedures in place in advance that help inhibit the hot reactions of the emotional brain. So what keeps investors from making better financial decisions? You know, it really is, it's just the, the challenges of how the human mind works. Emotions over intellect. Brains are, are, are lazy and like easy decisions. Greed and fear, very powerful forces. As a matter of fact, you know, people are so afraid of losing money. The overconfidence, people think they understand stuff they don't understand, but they sure feel like they do. And our memories are not very dependable. So when you had an experience earlier and you bring that memory forward to making a decision today, sometimes not very good. And then we trust the wrong sources. My view, you have a choice, Wall Street, Main Street, or University Street, the academic community. I'm just telling you, from my 55 years of experience, the academic community's work is actually being built for you. I've got four great sources of, these are great educational sites the balance. You, you want to read about some topic, they do one of the finest jobs, whether it's about IRAs or 401ks or some tax question or some asset allocation question. They are terrific. Morningstar, they are the top of the heap on mutual fund information. I mentioned Kiplinger earlier for the lists. And then MGPF, we are going to hear from the man who started Next Generation Personal Finance uh, uh, Tim Ranzetta in a few weeks, end of the month. He, is, he has got the most amazing organization providing free curriculum for homeschooling, for regular schooling, for people who want to teach their children about personal finance. An amazing man uh, on a mission uh, without compensation, uh, personally puts the money up to do what he's doing he is truly one of my heroes, and we'll have him with us. Today, 
not today, any day, I want to encourage you for anybody who is, you know, somebody getting started, go get the free PDF copy of If You Can by William Bernstein. He is one of the smartest people in the industry, great writer, but this is a simple, easy to read, short read, terrific. I hope you'll do that. Your money and your brain. I found a place where you can get a free PDF copy on the internet of your money and your brain. And if you want to buy it, if I had my book here, I'd show you. I've got notes on almost every page of his book. I've read it at least, at least six times. We're talking millions. People who sign up today uh, and get a free copy of this, and you'll be signing up for our newsletter. If you do, it's free. We will send you the PDF for, uh, for that book. Uh, and, and, and by the way, um, if you want a PDF, uh, I'll have to talk to Jim about this, but we will have a PDF available of this presentation. It is available now. I know you'll be able to get it at the uh, paulmerriman.com, and I think you'll be able to get it at uh, BCF uh, as well. Uh, this next week, oh, Christine Benz, an all-star from Morningstar, uh, eight years she's been the director of financial planning. She is a whiz. She's going to be talking about sequence of return risk, inflation risk, healthcare and long-term care risk, longevity risk. She is terrific, and she does a wonderful piece on the bucket strategy for taking money out in retirement. I'll be uh, back on April 15th. If you know anybody who's early in the process uh, or whether it be a young person just getting started or somebody who's starting late but just getting started, please have them join me. And then after that, we have Larry Swedro. And I I'm gonna be interviewing Larry for an hour. And then you're gonna ask him questions after that. We'll be talking about his new book, The Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement. And I'm expecting that you're going to write to me, Paul, at paulmerriman.com and say, please ask Larry this question. Happy to do it. And then Tam, Tim Ranzetta, as I mentioned before. And then this is our website. I hope you be, do become uh, one of our students because we are here to do all that we can to help you in that process. And you can sign up for that email if you wish there. And Jim, I am ready. I think I talked longer than I was supposed to. What else is new? Um, let me be here for to answer some questions if I might. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Let's uh, go ahead and close your... Um, yeah, you, oh, I got to stop. Sharing. Sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. There we go. You'll, you'll be able to see some of those questions down at, great. down at the bottom here. But um, so picking up from, from the top, um, the uh, question from Kathleen, how did Bill Huang manage to blow the hedge fund game? I don't want to make the same mistake with my billion dollar fund. Well, um, every, every uh, hedge fund has a strategy. I started the hedge fund in 1995. It has been uh, one of the better performing. It's been nominated a number of times for best in class uh, in this particular group. That particular strategy combines market timing with leverage. It's an aggressive strategy, not for everybody. But there's a set of conditions under which that fund could fail. Long-term capital management, by the way, run by some of the smartest people in the industry, uh, failed. Uh, and they failed for one reason was because they had a perfect strategy. Turned out it wasn't perfect, but they had a strategy that they believed they could borrow a hundred billion dollars on, uh, I think it was 15 billion. So they had a hundred billion at risk. All it had to do was go down one and a half percent and they were wiped out. And uh, in essence, the industry and the government had to come in and and salvage it because there was talk that if they had been allowed to fail, it would have brought down the entire financial industry globally. And yet nobody virtually knew the name long-term capital management until the damage was done. Great, thanks, Paul. 
Um, next question from Steve. Is it wise to hire a certified financial planner and pay 1% on our investments in order to save taxes on RMDs? Isn't that just shifting just uh, isn't that just shifting paying fees to a private corporation from paying the government? How does this help? Well, now I'm 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 a, just a little bit confused. First of all, let's I, let me talk about paying somebody one percent. I'm devoting my life to helping people do it on their own because the savings of one percent for the rest of your life can be of great consequence. The question is, can you deal with the emotion of it? And I was in the business of taking care of money for people who just didn't want to do it themselves. In fact, the way we built the business was showing people how to do everything on their own so they wouldn't have to hire us. But there are people who want that help. Uh, I would encourage people, if they can, to find somebody that will work by the hour. You may only need five hours of their time in order to get what you need out of them. To be fair, for full disclosure, my wife and I use a financial planner. But it's not because I couldn't do this, these things, but I would be a basket case. I would be worried about stuff that I don't worry about. And so there is that, just the, the freedom, emotional freedom that somebody's taking care of that for you and for your children and the family. And, and so, but, but every time I can save a young person a half of 1%, it should equal a million to a million and a half more money in retirement or to be left for others. If I could save somebody 1%, or another, if I could save somebody 2% or show them how to make 2% more for their lifetime uh, and they didn't pay me anything, that would be one heck of a return on the time it takes you to get the education because you got to stop and read or, or listen. So do I want people to pay 1% if they can do it on their own? No. If you can't do it on your own, do I want somebody to turn to somebody who's going to get a commission in the process? My answer is typically no. It's not that those people are evil. They are not evil. They just are human. And commissions com make it a more complex relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, whether I really answer Steve's question or not. Well, let me reframe it a little, like reframe the second half of that for because I, I think the, the question is, you know, sometimes there's, we, we talk about how um, you know, the right professional advisor can save you money in the form of um, taking tax, tax, uh, getting tax benefits out of that. But, um, but, there's, but I think what Steve's kind of getting to is that there's a, there's a continuum, right? So there's certain investment situations uh, where, where you do want to maximize your, your, your taxable, you know, you're, you might be in a taxable situation where uh, you want to hire a professional to help you navigate that. And then there's also the other side of that equation where the likelihood of, you know, you, you're, you're, you're not likely to put yourself in a really compromising tax situation if you were to do it on your own. Can you talk a little bit about that spectrum, Paul? Well, I mean, to the extent that something needs to get done and you don't do it, then you're better off to pay somebody to do it. I mean, it's, it, it, now the question is, will you get a return on it? And, and uh, it, to do that return analysis, you'd have to, you, it takes a little time. You have to look at the numbers. Um, my sense is that most people are not very good at taking care of these things themselves. One question is, could they find a CPA who could help them with the tax decision, who also happens to be a PFS, a personal specialist, financial specialist, same thing as a, they're the same thing as a, a certified financial planner and they might work by the hour. So it's a question of, could you get that same work done by somebody who would do it for less than 1% of your portfolio? You know, I see people in 401k plans. I don't know who the trustee is who sets this up, but they are charging all of the employees, about a half of 1% of, 
to have the right to have access to a mutual fund family and somebody to talk to. And that's fine when your account is 50,000, maybe. But when your account is a million and you're paying a half a percent and you don't even need their help or want their help, how is that fair to all those people who are individually paying that extra half of 1% that they didn't have to? Well, they might say, you could have, you could have used it. That's not a good argument as far as I'm concerned. So this is always a, sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. If it's a $10 million account and you're paying, um, I don't know, 20, 30, $40,000 a year, and out of that you're getting $5,000 worth of value, then you might have to question whether that's the right thing to do. Great, Paul. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the one minute the one minute response plan, uh, oh, just because we've got some really good questions here. So, um, that again. Uh, if someone was to um, to get a large amount of money like a windfall, would you recommend to them that they would invest all of that at once in the ten funds that you recommended, or would you advise that they spread it out over several months? When I was an advisor, I'd have to know a lot about them to make the to give the advice what else they have elsewhere, how much risk they're at elsewhere, how much risk they're taking with what they're going to do with the money right now. And so for most people who don't have the experience of the market, even though the studies show you're better off just to dump it all in, when you got it, put it in. I've never been very comfortable with that. I do think a dollar cost average strategy uh, has historically worked better for most people who are not savvy investors because the worst thing can happen you get all this money it's an inheritance it's maybe your parents money and you love them and you don't want to do anything that and then the first thing you do is you put it into something and the market goes down 50 percent. and now not only have you lost money but you screwed up your parents money it's a big emotional deal for a lot of people and so you have to take those things into consideration Two, treat it with a lot of respect. Great. So Paul, question, if, is it still a good idea to put college savings in the market if you're gonna need it in the next five years? Well, a lot of experts will say, if you're gonna need the money in three to five years, you shouldn't have any risk. Now remember that if you're, uh, if let's just say you're five years away from the, the, the first year of the students going to college, it's really, you're talking about nine or 10 years of, of investing in, in distributions. Look, you can look at the glide path of Vanguard. Uh, Vanguard has uh, funds that are managed for 529s. And you can see what they have chosen as the right combination of equity and fixed income at the time period that you're looking at. These are some of the brightest people in the industry. And I would say that would be, if you did what they're doing, you'd be probably headed in the right direction. Great. Um, so I wanna hop forward a couple. Um, I'm trying to decide if I should roll my pension as a lump sum into a traditional IRA or pay the large tax and roll into a Roth. Any recommendations on that topic? You know, something that that takes, uh, you need to work with somebody on that for your particular situation. I, I could not give advice that would lead to the right outcome. Great. Um, what's your take on international investing index uh, and what percentage is a good part of your portfolio? Well, John Bogle would say 20%. I'm talking about the equity part of the portfolio. I have, we have 50% of our equities are in internationals. Uh, we have portfolios that also show 70% in US, 30% uh, in uh, the international. It's really, it's not a huge difference in return. There is some difference when you add internationals. 30% is just fine but you do get some currency diversification. When things go haywire here, oftentimes they'll do better there, not always, but oftentimes. So like in the early 2000, that, that, 
that period, well, in fact, going back to the early 70s, the international markets did great while the US market just fell apart. So, so there is some, there can be some advantage, but if you don't want internationals in your portfolio, you are going to get most of what you need with as little as 20 to 30%. Great. To achieve diversity in my portfolio, is it wise to include a fixed index annuity? I wouldn't. Uh, well, excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, indexed annuity, index to the market. That You know something? There are so many terrible products in that arena that be, before you did that, I would encourage you to maybe go to a website, Stan the Annuity Man. He's got a, a huge amount of educational material. And uh, I would go again, StanTheAnnuityMan.com and read what he has written about these different kinds of products. Um, and no salesperson is going to call, just so you'll know. Uh, but there's some really bad, bad products in that arena. Great. When an employer's 401k plan doesn't give much choices on investments, on investment choices, and employer contribution is really small, should I contribute toward my personal investment account? Absolutely. For what little I know right there. Yes. Why? Well, to begin with, I don't know what your income is, but let's say you're 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 in a tax bracket where you're allowed to do a Roth, do a Roth. You can, you can get access in an IRA to all of the asset classes you want with lower expenses, with more diversification. So to the, to, to the extent that you can, I would move toward a do-it-yourself through an IRA. Great. Okay, well, we're just at the tail end of our, um, of our presentation for today. I wanna to thank you all for coming and I wanna thank Paul for, uh, for being here as always and putting together a terrific presentation. Um, Paul, do you wanna stick around for a little while and answer any questions that folks might have directly? I'll be happy to. And I would also, by the way, I would also uh, appreciate any feedback, paul at paulmerriman.com about the presentation what more you would like to uh, have us cover. We're hoping to have this be an annual event. And so anything you give me today, I can be thinking of using that, those thoughts for, for next year because we want this to be helpful to as many Bainbridge people and those that are not Bainbridge people um, as we can. That's, that's our mission. Okay. I appreciate Thanks you so coming. much. Yes, I will stick around. Okay. So for those of you that need to leave, go ahead and hop off. If you have any questions, um, go ahead and, and raise your hand and I'll um, unmute you and then we'll, uh, you can ask questions of them directly. Are you looking through the chat room, Jim? I am, yeah. Do you see the chat there too? Oh, I haven't looked at it. I'm sorry. I'm... And just for, for anyone who's still curious, I put in the chat in the chat box a list of a, a link for the slides for Paul's presentation. You can also find that at our website, bainbridgecf.org. Uh, look at the uh, the financial education series, and then just next to the title of this, you'll see the link for the PDF. No, uh, can we take a show of hands if somebody would rather not put it in the chat room? Or maybe we've actually worn people out. I think maybe, maybe, <laughs> we've, maybe we've reached that point. I'm, I no. just wanna make sure, I think you, you should all be able to see in your reactions um, that, oh, good question. Okay, how can I locate a by the hour financial planner? Um, well, you can go to Garrett Planning Network, G-A-R-R-E-T-T, -T, planningnetwork.com. They have advisors all over the country 
who by contract to be part of the Garrett Planning Network are required not only, to, they, they have to offer hourly services. And, and uh, it's difficult to find the hourly people. It's much easier to find the people who make the big money managing money for a percentage of the assets or taking commissions. It, somebody has to be willing to, um, to, to take a lot less income in their life if they are an hourly planner. I know, for example, uh, is it okay if I just give one name, Jim, or would you, uh, any, any concern about that? As long as it's not an endorsement from us. Right, okay. What I'm about to say is not an endorsement from BCF, Library U, or the Merriman Foundation, but Paul Merriman knows this lady. Her name is Trish Howe, and she's in Seattle. And she's not as old as I am. I mean, she's, she's been around the industry for a long time. And she's one of those people who finds, she's got a passion for trying to help people, even what helps young people, which is very difficult because when you're an advisor, you're really looking to help people who have more money because that's where the money is for the advisor. So um, there's one example, so. Great, okay, so Ricky's got a live question. I'll ask you to unmute there. Uh, hey, Paul, thanks, uh, what a great talk. I always love uh, talking, sorry, you might hear my kids in the background. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Rick. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to teach them young too. <laughs> um, I heard that uh, international investing you actually uh, helps when the dollar goes down or when there's inflation. I kind of didn't understand that. Um, could you sort of explain why investing if the dollar it gets weaker, uh, investing internationally might be a good thing? Well, what what happens? The relative value of international securities with a stronger dollar, they in essence go up in value. Uh, and so uh, that, and that happens, uh, currencies go up and down. And, and that's one of the reasons, by the way, that back in the seventies, the internationals did better than the US because their, their currencies were stronger. Uh, and it has to do with what the dollar will buy and, and uh, or, or uh, when you have, let me suggest this. This is one of these great examples. I mentioned the balance, uh, dot com. I really recommend you go to the balance dot com and read what they have to say about it. It's, it's a complex enough subject that you bet I would like you to get a really good explanation and it'll be better than mine. And uh, it may take a few minutes to go through it, but it'll be worthwhile. Great, thanks, Paul. I've got an another live question from Matthew. Hey, good morning, Paul. First, thanks for the presentation today and, and all you do for us. Um, a lot of the retirement planning nowadays seems to revolve around the 401k, but there are still some of us out there uh, who will be getting pensions such as uh, federal government employees. What are some different considerations people might uh, need to make if they are looking at a, having a pension instead of a 401k? Well, certainly at the time that you make the decision, uh, if, I, if I understand the question here, at the time that you retire, you can make the decision to put that pension to work and actually be guaranteed a monthly income for the rest of your life, maybe with or without a COLA, but, but uh, it'd be guaranteed. Uh, for a lot of people who have not learned how to deal with the stock market and investing with risk involved, uh, it, it might be foolish for them uh, to start doing that, particularly if that income from that pension is going to cover uh, a lot of the uh, cost of living of that individual. I know a lot of people who be, 
between their pension and their social security. And there are two of them that, that qualify for both of those things. They're in great shape. They don't have to have investments doing anything fancy. I always worry about people who decide to take a pension and invest it in the stock market. This is more likely to happen when the market is high and been making people a lot of money. And so people thinking they're in a sense smarter than the market uh, will get caught putting their life savings that have been put aside in that pension uh, at risk and all of a sudden uh, their life income is cut substantially. Um, I, I do think that when you have a pension and social security that may take care of your needs, uh, your cost of living, you can afford to be a lot more aggressive or more conservative with the money that you've saved above and beyond that pension. Um, and, and which begs the question for a lot of people, how aggressive should you be with that, that money that is above and beyond the, the needs you have today? I could make the case that if, if that money is eventually for your children, you should invest it with the risk tolerance of your children, what they should have. If it is really the backup in, ca in case something doesn't go right, you probably shouldn't be investing aggressively like you might for your children. So there are a lot of little decisions that are made in and around having different sources of, of, of income in retirement and how much risk that you take and how you, how you build that asset allocation equity versus fixed income. Does that get you along the right track or is there more, Matthew? Uh, that helps a lot. Thank you. Okay, good luck. All right, we've got another live question from uh, Johnny. Hey, Paul. I uh, just want to say thank you for kind of just the information and just uh, uh, just helpful content that you create. So I really do appreciate it and all the time that you uh, dedicate to, to uh, uh, giving this um, just information for, for new investors. And so I think for me, just uh, as a new investor and wanting to manage my own investments personally, um, I think the most daunting part is just trying to understand an investment strategy, understanding that uh, in some of your podcasts, you talk about uh, your portfolio changes or best time or your portfolio changes should be made when your financial goals have changed, not when the stock price has changed. And so I think I'm just trying to understand, you know, uh, just early on, just trying to understand, you know, how do I, how do I manage this portfolio? Um, and then also understanding kind of the risk loss tolerance. I know that's kind of a loaded question, but. Uh, <laughs> well, Johnny, you know, when you come back on April 15th, when I do the, the uh, we're talking millions of presentation, um, I will be addressing uh those those comments, I think, in that present uh, presentation, the the difficult thing for me. I'm 77 years old. I am trying my best to give you a strategy that would work for the next. How old are you, Johnny? 30. For the next 70 years. That's a lot to ask because. You know, target date funds are relatively new. Uh, ETFs are relatively new. Who knows in the next 70 years what's going to be thrown at you? My hope is that you will have a plan now that will get you to some place that you can't really know for sure is going to be there. I had no idea when I was 30 that by the time I was 40, that I would have managed a public company and uh, then started an investment advisory firm. We, we can't know these things. Uh, and that I had no idea if it had not been for Lou Mandel, a friend on the island of Bainbridge, who was one of the founding fathers of the financial literacy movement in our country, he retired here and he became a mentor. He changed my life. 
Now, I mean, the bottom line is you're going to have a hundred things that are going to happen to you. And I am trying to find a portfolio that is going to live through all of that for you. And you know, we've talked about the two funds for life strategy. We'll talk about that on the 15th. And then the four fund strategy. Y you need to find the glide path that combination of equities and fixed income and under what conditions will you change and have more fixed income? You need that, you need to have the right equities. The good news is they're very cheap and they're all available through indexes. And they're all available so you can rebalance them at no cost, no commission. And, and, and so there's never been a time that investing has been more efficient than it is right now. What we need for you is a strategy that hopefully you can live with over a long period of time. I'm working on an article right now, Johnny, about, I mean, I'm not advocating it for you, but what if a person decided they wanted to be all equity for the rest of their life? I've met people at my age that are still all equity. And by the way, they've done quite well. I would not have had the guts for it. But I want to look at it and think, who would this be right for? But as you know, I spend a lot of time warning people about the risks that they take with their investments. I guarantee if you follow my advice, you will lose money along the way. I want to make sure the amount of money you lose is acceptable to you so that you don't cash out and go put your money in an annuity. Um, but I'm still only a single teacher who cannot give personal advice. That's the challenge. Yeah. Um, Paul, another a question from Jackie. At about what age should we be shifting our funds to less aggressive funds as we near retirement? Um, that is... There, there are a whole bunch of different ways to do that. It's called the glide path. Let's say you're going to retire in 2060. You could go to Vanguard and look at the glide path of their target date fund. And that glide path would show exactly what they're going to do for you over the next 40 years. So you would see whether you want to put your money in their target date fund or you want to create your own glide path, you could use what Vanguard has laid out as the recommended glide path. Now then we come along and others like us to say, wait a minute, your target date fund doesn't have enough small cap value. We think you should add 10% small cap value. So then we're advocating for a change in the glide path. So anybody who's worth their salt is teaching or managing money knows a lot about the glide path. And the question becomes, who are you gonna trust to choose your glide path? Here's a glide path. Subtract your age from 120. Now, some people used to say 100. So if you were 20 years old, you'd be 80% in equities and 20% in bonds. And as you get older and older, you're going to have more bonds. Then people said, wait a minute, that's too conservative. Try this glide path. You take 120 and subtract your age. Now, all of a sudden, when you're 20 and you take 120, now you're 100% in equities at age 20 where you should be. But that glide path, in fact, one of those free books on my website is entitled 101 Investment Decisions Guaranteed to Change Your Financial Future. Jackie, go get that book free and read the appendix. The appendix is about a whole bunch of different, let's call them glide paths, how you would know how to change from equity to fixed income. Try that. And if that doesn't help you, get back to me. Great. Uh, Mike wants to know if there's a diversified international fund that you would recommend. Well, yes. As a matter of fact, uh, Mike, if you look at our, we have, go to paulmerriman.com. Then you'll see recommended, a link. When you go to recommended, 
Those recommendations are for funds that Vanguard, Fidelity, uh, Schwab, T. Rowe Price, and then there are ETFs. And we recommend international funds for big and small and value and blend and, and REITs. And we have recommendations for all of those different asset classes. Great. Um, do any of your books contain information about deaccumulation strategies to use after retirement occurs and one needs to start drawing from retirement assets? Let me suggest that you go to paulmerriman.com and take the best advice link. There'll be a drop down. The first thing you'll read about is the ultimate buy and hold strategy. That's about what equities I want you to own. The next thing is called the fine tuning tables. That will tell you how much in stocks and how much in bonds and what are the implications in terms of risk and return. The third level gets you down into, or the fourth level, into distributions, fixed distributions and flexible distributions. And in fact, I have brand new podcasts that I've done this year and, and, and also the tables that show people how they can select how aggressive or how conservative they want to be. If you take 5% out of a, what we call a fixed distribution strategy, you are likely, if you're very young, to run out of money before you run out of life, if you adjust that 5% by inflation. But if instead, you simply take 5% of whatever your value is at the end of each year for the following year's income, it lasts forever. You got to see it to believe it, but there are decisions that you're going to make that have a huge, huge impact on how you're going to be when you're old. And the problem is we don't know how old old is. I'm amazed I'm still alive. We're grateful for that. Um, <laughs> Follow up on that question from Tom. If my pension and social security covers my living expenses during retirement, should I be at 100% invested in stocks? You could be as long as, as you're sure you really have enough. I mean, some people say I have plenty. I'll give you an example of how, how interesting this can be. I'll ask somebody about their expenses. They'll tell me how much their expenses are. And I'll say, well, now, does that include your taxes? Oh, no, no, I didn't include my taxes. Well, I see, I see taxes as an actual expense. Yeah, and so you got to make sure everything is in there. But if you have the risk tolerance, and by the way, if you've not been an all or heavy equity investor for most of your life, being in retirement and starting to invest heavily in equities small sounds like the top of a bubble to me. I mean, it, it worries me that you'd be even considering it at the top of a market, but it, by the way, it would be hard to consider at the bottom of a market because people don't want to invest at the bottom of a market. Uh, but yes, you could be. And by the way, if you look at my fine tuning tables that I have on under best advice, you're going to see that even if you went 60% equity and 40% fixed income, the loss that you're going to sustain is going to be reasonable, but the returns of 60-40 have historically been great. Maybe you don't need to go to all equities to get a better return than what you're doing right now. So to a somewhat related question from Russell, so regarding pension, is it reasonable to consider a pending pension annuity or lump sum as the bond portion of a total portfolio and allow more equities to exist in the 401k? You, you can, you, you could. Uh, that takes, again, it should be worth the planner that you do that type of thing. Because uh, some people like to think of Social Security as a bond. And well, it, it isn't a bond. Um, it is guaranteed cash flow, either for you, for your life, or you and your spouse. Um, what I get concerned about is people say, well, I've got this social security, so that's a bond. And therefore I put that into my portfolio and now my portfolio could be all equities. 
then I ask them, well, what's your risk tolerance? Tell me how much would you be willing to lose, let's say just in a year? And they say, well, I, I, I don't know how much mine that is. Well, okay, 50%. Uh, no, I don't wanna lose that. Uh, I've never, never lost that kind of money before and now I'm retired. And we get them down to maybe 20% they're willing to lose. Well, that tells me that in reality, they probably in their equity fixed income portfolio need to take that loss down to the level that when the market is just falling apart, that you'll still stay the course. That's the magic of an advisor is it's the person who can keep you on track when you want to jump. When, when the fellow from that I've talked about in the past uh, from Louisville, John, when he when Clinton got elected and he said, sell everything. I mean, I, I worked for 45 minutes to keep him invested because I had to convince him that it didn't historically have the impact on the market that, that he thought it was going to have. He thought Clinton was the end of the world, just like some people felt that way about Trump when Trump got elected. And so the job is to try to keep people in there. And one of the things that keeps people in there and staying the course is when they don't expose themselves to more loss than they think is whatever their limit might be. And I don't like the, the fact that my wife and I are set up for a 25% loss. I don't like it, but I also know that I'm willing to accept that because I'm trying to grow the portfolio so I can leave some money to Bainbridge Community Foundation for one thing. Great. Um, so there's just two more questions. Um, one, is there a better time to rebalance your 10 fund portfolio or does it not matter? Well, uh, typically the first quarter of the month has historically been a good time to do that kind of work. Other people do it on their birthday. I mean, they have, a, they have some date that's set up, so that's what they do every year. Uh, it isn't important to rebalance every year. We're gonna do a study on this. I think if you rebalance every two, three years, that's probably enough. Um, the um, fellow who's the director of research for our foundation, uh, unpaid, uh, He's working on a new book called Two Funds for Life. It is a marvelous book. I've read the, I've read it and it's just great. But he talks about a process of actually nudging, not rebalancing, but nudging your portfolio as you take money out in retirement, actually taking money out of the asset class that is out of balance. And it's a fascinating study that would re, would eliminate the typical concern for rebalancing that people have. Right. All right, our final question. Um, so what is the best plan for which dollars you take from different areas of your portfolio uh, in retirement to also minimize taxes? So when you're trying to pull money out of your portfolio, do you pull it out of, where do you pull it out of first and um, in order to minimize taxes? Minimize taxes, you would probably take money, depending, let's say that the money you have is taxable in an IRA. When you take it out, you're going to be taxed or in a 401k, take it out, you're going to be taxed. They're not a Roth, it's a regular. Then you would be wise to consider taking money out of your taxable account first, because that would have less impact. See, if you take a dollar out of your IRA, every penny is taxed, unless it's a Roth. When you take money out of a taxable account, let's say that you're selling a stock and you've got a capital gains. Well, you're not gonna be taxed on the cost basis. You're only gonna be taxed on the marginal profit. And that would be a lower tax bracket, supposedly, than you would taking the money out of the IRA. So you use your taxable money first. Oh, I'll tell you who's gonna love this question. When Larry Swedro is on our, uh, on our meeting presentation later this month, uh, that is a topic he covers beautifully in his book, but I will make sure we cover that in the Q and A that I do with Larry. 
Mm -hmm. So do you, when you're, when you're in your seventies, do you need to worry about capital gains issues though? If you, if you've got uh, a portfolio of mostly equities? Well, if, if you have to have money and you're looking at the most tax efficient way to get at it, then you should take it, theoretically, you should take it out of the investments that when you cash them out have the lowest tax rate. Mm -hmm. And the lowest tax rate, if you're being taxed on everything that comes out of the IRA at the highest marginal tax rate you have versus being charged a tax only on the profit, you're better off to own, be taxed only on the profit. And that would be a, theoretically a capital gain at a lower tax rate than you're paying on the money you're taking out of the IRS. So it's better to use the taxable money first. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of people in their balance between the 401k, for example, and IRAs and their taxable, they may have all equities in the taxable and have the, the less tax efficient assets inside of the 401k and the IRA. Okay, so I guess one, one more follow up on that. The, so if you, if you have an equi high equities portfolio and you have, and you want to put more, you want to diversify and, and include more bonds, how do you do that to maximize the tax, you know, the capital gains issues of selling the- Oh, now that's a whole other, that's a whole other question. Okay. Well, I mean, when I sold my business uh, in 2012, I knew that I would never, I mean, that was a business that was built to try to make money. It wasn't a passive thing. So I, I had to make the decision. Do I sell my company and pay the tax or do I take the risk of continuing to be in the business and having the responsibility of that and the risk? I thought it was time to pass the baton of risk to somebody else young, rather than I don't think that I should have, I should have all that risk in my retirement. And I knew I'd never be able to replace that, but it was very risky. And so that's that decision. I know a lot of people who still hold major positions, a lot, I know some, in, uh, in Microsoft. And it's easy for people to say, oh my God, you shouldn't have that much money in one company. And, uh, and, and they will often ask kind of, well, would you have convinced me to sell it 10 years ago or 20 years ago because of that? And of course, this is like trying to tell the, the lottery winner that it's stupid to buy a lottery ticket. It's a tough talk. It's a, it's a tough conversation. But uh, my sense is that, again, it's never the right thing to do the right time to do the wrong thing. The question is whether somebody thinks it's wrong to have the Well, I guess on that, <laughs> we recognize that I think you're, you've, you froze there at the tail end. So that's, oh, the, that's oh, nature okay. telling us that, that it's probably time to, to wrap up. So um, thank, thank you again, you. Paul. Thank you. Yeah. All of you came out and, and stayed through all of this. Appreciate it. And uh, this will be archived. Yes, on our, on our website. And I sent the link to that in the chat. And, uh, um, and th that'll be within the week that you'll see that uh, come up there. And there's a PDF of his presentation on that or, or live right now on the site. So great. Thank you, Jim. Okay. And thank you, folks. Thanks, All of everybody. Bye-bye.